Uh, good morning and welcome to the sixth meeting in 2015 uh, of the Health and Sport Committee. Uh, I would ask everyone in the room, as I usually do at this time, to switch off mobile phones as they can often, uh, often interfere with the sound system. Although, I would ask um, um, you know, visitors and others to uh, note the fact that uh, some of us are using tablets here this morning uh, instead of our hard, hard copies of the pa papers. Um, can I welcome Jackie Bailey, MSP, who joins us for uh, item one on our agenda. Welcome, Jackie. Um, our first item uh, on the agenda today, of course, is to take evidence from the Cabinet Secretary following Lord McLean's report on the CD for sale outbreak at Vale of Leven Hospital in 2007. Uh, which sadly, 34 people lost their lives. The Cabinet Secretary uh, uh, has asked to speak uh, uh, at this point, and I'll give her that opportunity now. Uh, but firstly, uh, I should um, uh, welcome uh, the Cabinet Secretary, Shona Robinson of Health and Wellbeing Sport, Fiona McQueen, Interim Chief Nursing Officer of the Scottish Government, uh, and of course, Paul Gray, Director General Health and Social Care and Chief Executive NHS Scotland. Welcome to you all. Uh, now give um, the Cabinet Secretary the opportunity to make some opening remarks and then we will go directly uh, to our first question from the committee. Cabinet Secretary. Well, thanks, Convener. Um, thanks for inviting me today to discuss the, the Vale of Leven Hospital Inquiry report. And first of all, just to reiterate my sincere apologies to the patients and families affected by the, the Vale of Leven Hospital C, uh, C. outbreak in 2007 8. And secondly, I'd like to again put on record my thanks to Lord McLean and his team for their commitment to the inquiry and for producing such a, a comprehensive and detailed report. Since uh, Lord McLean published his report on the 24th of November last year and my statement to Parliament on the 25th of November, I committed to undertake a number of actions to ensure that the recommendations within the report are implemented. The focus of those actions has been to ensure the focus is on making improvements across the NHS. Although the focus of the work going forward is Scotland-wide, it's important to remember the patients and families affected by this tragedy and that's why they are included throughout this whole process and will enable them to be assured that the recommendations are being implemented. To assist the committee, I'd like to provide a, a very brief summary of the actions that have been taken since the report was published. I wrote to all boards uh, following publication to ask them to assess themselves against 65 recommendations for health boards in Lord Maclean's report and to respond to me by the 19th of January this year. As I stated in my paper to the committee, I'm pleased to confirm that NHS boards have now responded. The committee will recall that we undertook to implement all of the recommendations, and that's, of course, what we will do. I'm pleased to report that boards have assessed so far that they have either fully or mostly implemented around three-quarters of the recommendations. Once further analysis of the responses has been undertaken and completed, I plan to publish those responses on the Scottish Government website. I'd also be happy to share them with the committee uh, if members would find that useful. I committed to establishing an implementation group to oversee the implementation of the health board recommendations. However, uh, following the, the group's first meeting on the 16th of February, they have agreed to oversee the implementation of all 75 recommendations. The implementation group have agreed their remit in terms of reference and I'd be happy again to share those with the committee. The implementation group will be chaired by Fiona McQueen, Interim uh, Chief Nursing Officer, and includes a number of stakeholders representing patients and families, NHS, social care and the unions. The minutes of these meetings will be published on the Scottish Government's website and we'll be developing the web pages with family members. The implementation group will ensure that its work links into current policies and the work of other groups to prevent any duplication. In addition to a, a a patient's and family's representative being on the implementation group, I've agreed to also establish a, a reference group. This group will help to provide assurance to the patients and families and the wider public that the recommendations are being implemented and to give them a, a voice to challenge and support the implementation group. The group is being established to give the patients and families and wider public a, a voice in the implementation process. 
Invitations have been issued to ask a, a number of stakeholders to nominate a member to be on the reference group, and it's anticipated that the first meeting will take place in March. As with the implementation group, the minutes will be published on the Scottish Government's website. In my statement to Parliament, I also committed to publishing the Scottish Government's full response to Lord Maclean's report in the spring. It's my intention to stick to this timetable and I'd be happy to let the committee know in due course the date for publication. Scottish Government officials are working on the full response and will ensure that there's input to it from the implementation group and patients and families. I hope this demonstrates Scottish Minister's commitment to progressing this work and to assure you that I'm taking the necessary measures to make the improvements needed to improve patient care across the NHS. And I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. The first question this morning is from Colin Keir. Uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Good morning. Um, I must admit, as somebody who's come just into this for the first time uh, in terms of the veil of leaving, it was a very trying report to um, to read, um, and uh, I can well see how this can uh, obviously uh, be a very emotional subject for a great deal of people. Can I ask on the actually the first recommendation? I think I believe is with the um, in relation to. Uh, HEI and uh, being given the power to close wards to new admissions. Uh, will this require primary or secondary le legislation? Uh, well, we could do it either way. We could do it through um, prim the primary legislation vehicle, uh, whether that's the, the public health bill, or we could do it through secondary uh, legislation. Where I'm at at the moment is really to look at what would be the most um, efficient and um, speedy uh, route for implementation and that may end up being secondary legislation but the committee can be assured that there would be the full opportunity to input uh, and uh, discuss and, and debate uh, that uh, the, the, um, the measures and the, the legislation, legislative proposal uh, whether that's through um, the public health bill or whether it's through secondary legislation but I'm I, Think I would like to get this into um, uh, into legislation um, as quickly as possible. Can I carry on, uh, convener? Uh, in light of the report, does the do you uh, have any plans to at this minute in time in your mind that uh, enhances the inspection and monitoring process uh, that, that uh, HEI could use? Is there anything which is which you have in your mind as being uh, a, a must-do? Uh... Well, first of all, I should say that, you know, that the Healthcare Environment Inspectorate is a very thorough um, and um, effective tool at inspecting our health service. It doesn't pull any punches. I mean, you would only have to look at recent reports to see that, um, you know, it absolutely they reveal where practice is good but they absolutely reveal where practice is not good and where improvements need to be made so um, it is a very effective organisation and if there are ways of enhancing that and of course the, this, the recommendation it was part of that in terms of the ability to, to close wards um, I know that, uh, that uh, um, there will no doubt be discussions um, and will be discussions with HEI uh, and others around um, if there are any other measures that they would like to be taken um, to strengthen the work that they do. But I have to say they um, at the moment do a very good job and I think they have been instrumental in driving improvement. But uh, you know, if they come forward and say that they would like uh, additional um powers beyond what Lord McLean recommended, then I would certainly be willing to, to listen to uh -huh. that. Just one more uh, question. It's really in relation to what you said about the uh, the replies you've had from the boards uh, across Scotland, the, the three quarters of the recommendations dealt with. What's the time scale that they would anticipate actually uh, putting all the recommendations into uh, practice? We, the implementation group will um, be 
working very closely to make sure that the three quarters of the recommendations are monitored and overseen in their implementation because I think quite rightly the implementation group would want to make sure that all of the three quarters of the recommendations that have been implemented are implemented um, to the extent that the implementation group are happy with. So there'll be that oversight and monitoring. In terms of the, the rest of the recommendations, you know, as soon as possible, but making sure they're done thoroughly. Fiona, do you want to add a bit? I, I think although we're saying that, that there's there's some that aren't fully met, in many cases they're, they're almost fully met, so there's been really good progress. Other aspects will be met in, in some boards sooner than others. I think by the time that the report is published, we'll be able to say with confidence that the majority will have been met completely. I think in particular the relatives are, are keen that we don't have a tick box exercise, so we absolutely need to make to find ways and we would be looking at our inspectors to, to help us to, to check and test what boards have said. So I think by the time the report is published in spring, the majority of these will have been met. And if they're not met, then there will be firm plans in place where we have to, to put new systems and processes in place. So that they will have started with a trajectory of, of when we will have been able to meet them. It's yeah, very heartening. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Rhoda Grant, followed by Bob Dorf. Thank you, convener. Um, the report recommends that um, each health board has a, a task force set up. Can I ask what progress has been made? Has every health board now got a task force? Yep. Do you want to? Yeah, we, every, every health board has a team in place who they have an infection control committee and there are good lines of governance from boards to, to bedside and that. Nationally, I'm reconvening the task force, so I'm changing the approach whereby we monitor each AI and through that, we will then look at specifically what's meant by a task force. So we do have infection control committees. We have infection control managers and doctors and nurses who have specific responsibilities. We've reissued our uh, guidance on the infection control manager and are reviewing what needs to be done. So whilst they might not have something that's called a task force, every board has their infection control committee that essentially works as a task force. The National Task Force that I'll be um, pulling back <coughs> together again to, although we've had systems in place to monitor HEI, my view is that, that I want to take forwards a smaller, more focused group so that we can fully oversee what we're doing. And we would then work with boards to determine whether the current Infection Control Committee situation is suitable and satisfactory. And, and I'm absolutely confident they do a very good job when you look at the uh, the rates of, of reduction in infections, um, whether we need anything additional and more for task force. So th they may not have task force called task force, but they have teams who, who work in that way. And, and who's involved in those teams? Well, infection control manager, infection control doctor, infection control nurses. In the majority of cases, lay members of the public are also involved and, and other clinicians and managers, cleaning staff, so hotel services, uh, facilities staff, where the engineers, uh, are so full wide multidisciplinary team. Okay. Um, th there was a recommendation also that all the policies that came from Scottish government should have um, an implementation strategy associated with them. Is that happening, and how is it being monitored? That, that's happening. It's being monitored through, I think, the looking at the HEI, the difference. So within three months, the, the inspectors will be looking to make sure that that's been put in place and taken for, uh, taking in, in force. And the task force that I'll be chairing will also oversee what's happening with the implementation. Okay. And what focus is that having on cleaning? Because cleaning is still an issue. We're still picking up the newspapers and uh, reading stories about you know, cleaning, how's that being dealt with? Some of it is captured within some of these recommendations, but uh, there's other action that we need to take. So um, one of the things I ask the, the chairs, I meet with the, the all the chairs of the health boards on a regular basis at the last meeting. Um, I asked every single one of them to take... Um, personally to go out and with their team, so senior management team, and to look at 
all of their hospitals in terms of the, the cleanliness of them. So not to wait for reports to come in to analyse whether or not their cleanliness standards were up to scratch, but actually to go out proactively and look for themselves um, and to report back to me on assurance that they have done that. So that process is underway. Fiona, you've been overseeing... Do you want and, to... and, and they have written to the Cabinet Secretary um, with some very de detailed plans and proposals of, of what's happening in terms of going out and taking that forwards. We do routinely monitor and, and help, uh, we have the Health Facilities Scotland do monitor what's happening with cleanliness. But you're right, there are areas where our inspectors are finding that the, the, the cleaning standards haven't been met. So with the Cabinet Secretary having written to the chairs We'll be looking at that within our implementation group to make sure we're reaching the farthest corner of the farthest ward to make sure that the cleaning standards are maintained. It's not just day-to-day -day cleaning standards. It's if, if you have an outbreak of something like C. diff, you need to have the resources available to you that pulls in cleaning teams almost immediately because, you know, nurses have to nurse and we know that they're under more strain now than ever and kind of time pressures and the like and um, if they have to decide whether they're looking after someone who's really ill or if they're cleaning up after somebody else and also obviously if the nurse is going around cleaning up but then going around other patients as well but you know that, that includes an infection risk i mean there needs to be dedicated cleaning teams that can be called on at a moment's notice and yeah. get in there well that under the infection control procedures that's part of it that you know if um, an issue is identified then the systems are there to ensure that happens but i think there is a a wider message about you know basic cleanliness is, is everybody's responsibility and is everybody's responsibility to raise concerns. I mean, in some ways, in the same way as we have uh, that message getting through around um, hand washing and basic infection control procedures, uh, I want to see the same um, attitude towards cleanliness. Now, obviously, there are complex issues around infection control. You can clean and clean and clean and clean, and it only takes one finger on one part of the, you know, to spread infection. So it's not just as simple as, as uh, clean. But without doubt, for public confidence and patient reassurance, people should expect to see the, the areas, uh, particularly that patients are in, to be uh, of a, a, a clean standard. Um, so there is more that, that we want to do around that to make sure that message uh, is uh, pushed across um, and that we make sure that, you know, that, again, that there's proactive um, action taken to address um, any shortcomings in that, particularly within patient areas. And that we also use um, the learning from the reports that, that haven't been good uh, because some of those are addressing some common themes um, that that we don't wait for further reports, that we take that action and each board is expected to act on the reports, whether or not it's from their health board or not, they should be expected to act on the lessons that are uh, being uh, raised through that particular report. And again, the work that Fiona was describing will make sure that we do that. See, Dennis, uh, you're, you're after Nanette, Dennis. Uh, is, is, there a, uh, is there any concern? You set a, um, you know, a, a hard pace in your statement uh, recently in, in, in Parliament. Is there any sense, you know, I might be an old cynic here, but, you know, I, I noticed the difference from the language this morning uh, and the report uh, that we got from the government last week where we were talking about 80%. Um, of the recommendations today, we're talking about 75% of the recommendations. Uh, we we are talking, uh, you know, in the lines this morning about the definition of task force not being cleared. Um, and uh, there was just one other point that's escaped me. At this, it was just raised my attention. Have you are, are you are you absolutely confident, cabinet secretary? That I the can, pace sorry. in this is not slipping and you are going to meet the deadlines that you have placed on the boards to address the issue? Yes, and perhaps I can explain that the 75% the is of the 65 recommendations, the 80% is of the 75 recommendations, and maybe we should have just used the, 
um, consistent uh, language there, but you, you can be absolutely assured that the time frames that we have set out um, and the commitments we've made will absolutely uh, be the case. And I think also the fact that we have involved the families in the implementation group and the reference group should bring a, an external scrutiny to that that I think is, is really important um, because it's not just about boards telling us they've implemented the recommendations. It's about having that external assurance that the families um, are absolutely confident that, and they feel that boards have done absolutely everything to implement the recommendations and that there is oversight and monitoring of that so, absolutely. Okay. Okay, we meet, meet it on to have you, Richard, you want in and... Later. For, for a, 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 Richard, Richard, uh, Lion Richard Simpson. Uh, I've got on my list Bob Doris. Okay, um, Kavira, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, could, could, could I maybe start off by just saying, look, I'm... I'm a Glasgow representative. I'm born and bred in the in the Vale of Leven. Uh, all my family are still down there. I've got elderly relatives, particularly my mother and father. They use the Vale Hospital. Unfortunately, they have to use the Vale Hospital on a fairly regular basis. And I know we're talking about an absolute tragedy that happened in 2007, but I'd kind of like to place on record the excellent service that, that my family gets at the Vale today. Um, and I think it's in that context that I want to ask... Um, some questions without any complacency at all, because we have to strive to make sure that we are implementing absolutely every, every aspect of, of these recommendations. But I thought that was important to to say. Um, so looking at, at some of um, Lord McLean's recommendations, recommendations 10 to 12 talk about uh, information that, that was or wasn't provided to patients and relatives, and a couple of really terrible examples in relation to C. diff being compared to just, just a wee bug and kind of played down and real mixed messages over how you deal with soil clothes and should families take them home and how are they stored and that that kind of thing. Real real basic things, I suppose, that we would have to say. So my kind of question's in two parts. I'm hoping that those real basic things have, I would like to think, long before today now been dealt with to look for some confirmation in relation to that but there was a wider kind of recommendation and I think the Cabinet Secretary referred to it in a statement to Parliament uh, where you said that you would want to roll, roll out a robust quality assurance system to put patients, families and their experience at the centre of the work to ensure that information in relation to all this is easily uh, accessible to the public. Um, in other words, clear messages are out there at the hospital on the ward and how to deal with all this. So, in two parts, I suppose, are you confident that those, what might seem like silly wee things, but deeply worrying, deeply worrying things in 2007 have already been addressed? But I suppose the wider question is when the work that I think it was the Chief Nursing Officer was going to do forward work in that information, has that started? When will it start? What kind of timescales are there around that? I'll bring Fiona in on some of the detail in a second, but ab absolutely, and I think one of the real issues that arose was the inconsistency of information, um, different messages, no clear um, information, for example, around dirty um, uh, clothing, <coughs> soil clothing, uh, all the things that just really were um, hard to understand now that, that that could have been the case. So absolutely, there is very, very clear patient information now um, that that is standardised and, and clear um, and, uh, you know, something that has, it was well um, taken down you know, the road of, uh, and, and, and sorted well before the report was was issued because it's such a fundamental issue. Um, Fiona, do you want to? I, th I think the, the, the care assurance system that, that we're looking at, and you're absolutely right, there's a number of these, I would call essential components of care uh, that have now been changed. So information that, that people have, access to that information. What we've learned from the patient safety programme is if you put a big system in all of a sudden, it doesn't necessarily work. So putting systems in place and testing it, changing it, moving it forwards, we find is, is the best way to do that. So the, the, 
what we're calling the care assurance system, where we recognise that individual components of care are incredibly important, but when you look at them all together, it becomes even more important to people who, who are unwell. So information to families and, and patients' loved ones, uh, cleanliness, uh, nutrition, uh, caring for people for the fluid balance and what we would call the person-centred care, wrapping all of that together. What we have is we've, we've agreed and defined standards. In three health board areas, we're currently testing these standards. They have been well researched and well evidenced and we're confident that these are the right standards we need. What we then need to do is put them out across Scotland once we've agreed and have a form of what we would call assurance and accreditation so that each ward is safe, it's clean, it's person-centred and people who use the wards would, will have confidence about the, the information. We've already, as you see across Scotland, uh, we have information about care within wards but we would put a, a simplified, straightforward so no, no matter which ward or department you went into Scotland, our care assurance system would be there in a very straightforward and meaningful way. We've started testing it. I expect by the beginning of May that we will have agreed the whole system and, and planning that then for rollout. And that would be clear, um, unambiguous, uh, including workforce, including infection control standards, there for the public uh, to see and have assurance and confidence. So we would start rolling it out um, by late spring, early summer across Scotland. Okay, that that that, that that's very helpful. Knows to get, get get the time time scale uh, around that. Of course, with any care assurance system, there has to be checks and balances in the system. I suppose it's in that light. I would see. Uh, HEI who, are, who who do unannounced, I think from 2009 they started doing un, unannounced inspections and I don't want to be alarmist here at all, I would expect more cases of poor hygiene to be identified by definition that there's now unannounced inspections in the system that would be a check and balance to make sure that health boards and hospitals are, are doing their jobs properly so I would obviously clear, clear to hope that there's a number of checks and balances in the system in relation, I don't see that in an alarmist way, but just by, by definition, unannounced inspections should lead to identifying areas for improvement. That's why we have it there. Um, I'm just wondering how that all fits in, in, in uh, with, I suppose, recommendations in nursing care, and I think that's 13 to 33 in, in Lord McCain's report. You were talking about nationally ag agreed standards, so I'm just going to kind of read from my notes what Lord, Lord McLean said. He talked about clear and effective lines of responsibility, keeping of accurate patient records and auditing them, the role and responsibility of the nurse in charge of each ward, ensuring proper systems of care planning, communication with relatives, ensuring the right skills and staff mix in, in each ward. So um, I'm not sure if that's what you were talking about, Ms McQueen, when you were giving, giving that information, but the Cabinet Secretary also rightly said that every healthcare staff member is a has a frontline responsibility in relation to hygiene. So in relation to that skills and staff mix, um, I mean, I know very well with my, my nurse being a wife, you get domestics on ward, you get auxiliaries but on ward, you get various categories of, of, of nurses on, 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 on the ward. They each have their own role within, within the system. It's, I'd want to be confident that every staff member out there is clear irrespective of where they are as a cog in that machine, they have that frontline responsibility. And obviously some information around, uh, I don't know if we were talking about the same national agreed standards or not that you referred to in your previous answer, when the ones in relation to um, care planning and nursing documentation, when they're likely to be agreed and when they're likely to be implemented, and will you be looking at that specific about what the staff mix is like? So I'm accepting and I agree wholeheartedly that every staff member has a frontline infection control responsibility. But as part of that, every nurse, every auxiliary, every domestic, every doctor has their own part as the cog within that machine. Is there a need for greater clarity over who's doing what? Will that be taken in within the skills mix? And is, is that the kind of thing we're talking about, about nationally agreed standards? Uh, yes, and I, I think part of the the issue I raised at the the Vale of Leven was was about skill mix and but also about leadership, and uh, and and 
who takes responsibility. So there absolutely is a need for everybody to take responsibility responsibility in terms of infection control being everybody's business. But there also needs to be leadership in what happens to, to make sure any issues and problems are identified and then more importantly acted upon. And of course that what that part of the, the system uh, the Vale of Leaven outbreak wasn't there and didn't work and um, the work that's happened since then is, is crucially important in addressing that. Do you want to... I'll, I'll pick up a, a few of your questions. In terms of looking at um, <coughs> nursing numbers and skill mix, we have the workforce tools that we're putting in place, and I've agreed with a nurse directress as recently as last week that we need to do more work on skill mix, <coughs> so that's work that we're going to be taking forwards. And the workforce, in terms of the care assurance system, workforce is an integral part into that. In terms of whose who's job is it to do what, were you, if it's with regard to cleaning, then that is something that our inspectors currently go and they'll, they'll go in in an unannounced way and they will ask the junior doctor or the cleaner or the physiotherapist or the nurse if they know what to do with a spillage or, or what to do with um, personal protective equipment. So that's currently being looked at. We've also asked Health Protection Scotland as a consequence of this and in part looking at the time it takes to clean to do a bit more detailed work on timing of cleanings and, and checking and testing who is the best um, person to do um, each, each piece of cleaning. And in terms of the standards you asked about, currently there are standards. Each health board has standards of record keeping, uh, models of care for care planning, and what we, we will do is agree a national approach to it so that it, it's, there's less variability, more transparency about the, the standards that, that we have. Well, just to check, I mean, that's all very helpful, and I'll go back and I'll reflect on that evidence. It was very detailed. Are those a different set of standards you were talking to? We talk about standards in relation to the care assurance system. Um, same ones, right? Thank you. That's very helpful. Thank you. <coughs> is there a great number of inspections, or is there an inspection plan that you're aware of that, that you know that, that that will be carried out? Yeah, I mean, there's a cycle of inspections um, that ensure that there is a the um, HGI get around the, the system and look at different parts of the system, so whether it's a focus on older people's care um, or whether it's the front door of the hospital. So there's a, a cycle of inspections. But as they lay out, looking at what they've done the previous year and the year before that, and then look, I look forward um, to make sure that they get a, a, good, a good balance and that they, um, I guess, are, are inspecting enough of a range of... Uh, services um, to be able to um, bring out any issues that would have um, application to similar settings elsewhere. So they, they work, um, they, they do have systems to identify that. Um, Fiona, do you want and, to? And they risk assess, Healthcare um, yeah. Improvement Scotland um, do risk assess, so they ask for information from boards and they make their own decision about where they would want to go. And what you might notice in the HEI, so the cleaning reports because there's some time between the inspection and it published if if the inspectors go and they find a hospital is not clean they may go back the next day or they may go back the next week that often is published in in the one report yeah. so it's not obvious but they do uh, follow up in areas where they've not found things to be satisfactory yeah but they they inspect in a wide area of responsibilities so how, how, do, how do we ensure that they've got the balance right? Right, right, for the purpose of this discussion, it's cleanliness. So there's a big pressure, there's reports there, debate in Parliament, Cabinet Secretary before the committee, so there's a big pressure to do that. So have we got the resources to take on that, those additional inspections? Have we got the expertise in terms of the staff uh, and... Uh, the, inspect the inspectors, because you know, they'll have different specialities. Uh, is, that, is that an area that, uh, that needs bolstering? Um, have, have we got the people and the resources to do this properly right across the board? Yes, uh, we do. They have the ability to draw on um, experts and inspectors from a whole range of different areas and they, they do that depending on what the, the inspection is that they're undertaking so they can draw from a whole range of, of individuals with different backgrounds depending on, on the uh, area that they're, they're going to inspect and they're able to do that but obviously if they you know we are giving this a huge priority and uh, you know we'll make sure that the resources are there 
uh, for the inspections. We certainly haven't had any concerns raised around that, um, but you know, we certainly keep a, a dialogue going to make sure that they do have the the, the level of resource required to, to do the, a, a good job, and I think they are doing a good job. The, the balance as well is, you know, it's not just that they go in and inspect and that's, you know, the end of it. There's the health improvement side of things actually works with the, the, the board, the local management team, the staff to make the improvements identified in the report, which is really equally as important. So the issues are identified, but before the inspection team go back to make sure if there were concerns, that those concerns have been addressed, the improvement processes will be put in place and they will be helped to make the changes that they need to make. So they're not just left to, to get on with it and to share best practice that's happened elsewhere. I suppose the, the concern is a shared learning mm -hmm. because we see many reports <coughs> from one year to the end of the year and from a two-year period Mm -hmm. Where we're identifying the same problems, and each, you know, that an inspection report is something to survive and get over and manage publicly. Well, the, mm -hmm. the sharing, you know, what makes yeah. me wonder that um, in a two year cycle we identify many problems in one hospital board or one hospital within a board, and, the sh and we then, a year later, or even two years later, mm -hmm. identify the problem again in another hospital within the board and the question for me is why does that happen when the you know why isn't there any shared learning why are the issues that are addressed in one hospital not automatically pushed forward in others and I think that continues to happen which is a real concern. You raise a, a very good point and that was why um, the message I gave to chairs um, at the last meeting was absolutely about that. Don't wait for the inspection team to come in and inspect your services. Look at what's happened, not just from reports from hospitals within your own patch, but reports from hospitals in other boards and take the learning from that and make sure that proactively you are looking at what at those issues and are, more importantly doing something about it. We've also taken that work further though and um, Health Improvement Scotland are also doing that work so they're taking the learning from our report and are then making the recommendations to the service that you know you need to look at this so exactly your point don't wait for a report to find the same things in a, another healthcare setting make sure you are looking to make sure that <coughs> your hospitals have already addressed this. So we're stepping up that work. Um, the, the senior management team within each health board area taking um, I think more responsibility for that is important too. There's the role of the non-execs as well that a lot of boards are trying to involve more in some of that work too. Uh, so you, you make a good point and what I would like to, to see and, and more confident of is that we are getting better at doing that um, and hopefully we'll be able to demonstrate that to you. We'd, but uh, as, as I back to this thing, we would spend all our time on the inspections, getting that, and we're not getting back to ensure that that shared learning. And I'm, you know, I, I don't know if there was uh, an assessment about what would need to be, you know, what needs to happen in the inspection service. I don't know whether there was an evaluation. Uh, um, um, fr from yourselves o over the resources that the inspection agencies have, whether their budgets need increase, whether the resources need increase, whether they need more uh, full-time employees rather than part-time employees, or or or, or using uh, using uh, using uh, experts uh, from the health service themselves, where we get into a conflict situation or a possible conflict situation where we are using the health service, not independently, but people whose careers depend on the health service to inspect the service themselves. And I think there are, there are questions that arise out of that. Would you agree or not? Well, one of the things we've just done in the budget, of course, is to allocate another two and a half million for quality improvement, which is absolutely part of making sure that we improve quality and the, the, learn the lessons, apply those, don't wait for um, inspections just to do that. So that, that resource will help to do that. Paul, do you want to speak? Yeah, I, I think, convener, two or three things to mention. First of all, um, I'm sure the committee is aware, but in case they're not, they um, 
Chief Executive of Healthcare Improvement Scotland comes uh, to the, the meetings of Chief Executives and the Chair of Healthcare Improvement Scotland to the meetings of the Chair. So although there is a degree of independence about what Healthcare Improvement Scotland does, nevertheless these points that the Cabinet Secretary has been making and that I've been making to the Chief Executives are made with Healthcare Improvement Scotland in the room, so they're not separate from that discussion. Your, your second point about um, the uh, you know, whether it's appropriate to have inspections carried out by people who are within the NHS. I, I think the evidence of the Healthcare Improvement Scotland reports, for example, done on NHS Lanarkshire and NHS Grampian, would make it fairly clear that um, the colleagues from other parts of the service do take their professional duties very seriously indeed, and if a robust report is required, they will deliver a robust report. The risk associated with having health, uh, any form of improvement inspection or review uh, carried out by people who are who exclusively who are not uh, within the service in um, uh, filling out their professional duties from day to day is, of course, um, you, you, you then risk getting an inspection regime that uh, depends on people who are, who are not day-to-day -day involved in the delivery of patient care and services. And I think getting that balance right, the committee's right to ask the question, but getting that balance right is very important. And I would certainly want to see inspection regimes continuing to include people who are themselves part of the front line in delivery of patient care and services. It's maybe an issue we can't move on. Is you supplementary? supplementary on that? Yeah, okay. yeah, just very briefly, uh, that in terms of the frequency of inspections, um, d does HIS look at the, the variation? Because that's a theme that I've certainly been pressing on a whole range of issues. Uh, that if we take, for example, the last report, um, the, the Lothian had a rate of 48.1. Uh, which had increased from 41.8 in terms of the rate of bed occupied, bed occupied days compared to the target figure of 32. So it was going in the wrong direction. But does that mean HIS take that into account in terms of their unplanned? You know, because it's also, of course, it's the whole of Lothian, which is mm -hmm. a big area, and it could be any hospital in there that's causing the problem. Well, they would risk assess all of that in terms of where they would focus their inspections on. So they, as Jonas said earlier on, they when they're making their plans for the inspection processes for the, the coming year, they will look at all of those factors in order to risk assess where they think their time is best spent, um, and they take those factors into account. And the other bit of supplementary is, if you take something like the PVC bundle report on Glasgow, which was repeated three times in three separate reports and was still unsatisfactory and was still a high priority, uh, in terms of the McLean, the McLean report, you know, what action do you expect HIS to take when they get not once, not twice, but three times a repeat on the same high priority issue that the PVC bundle is not being, uh, guidelines are not being appropriately followed? Do you want to put that? I think that is something, and I know that Glasgow have taken that very seriously and they've, they've invited um, other help and support in to make sure that the, the PVC bundle is, is put in place. What HIS would also do is take Health Protection Scotland's advice, so looking at the other infections, such as the staph aureus, the, the bloodstream infections, that would be caused perhaps by the, the PVC bundles not being appropriately made, and Glasgow's performance in that is good. So it, it's looking at everything in the round, and Health Protection Scotland as well will, will, will advise his in, in terms of looking at the monitoring of infections as a consequence of the bundles. PVC bundles are part of the patient safety programme, so there is a continuous improvement element of that to, to make sure that that's fully implemented. Thank you. Paul. Yes. Thank you. Um, it was also just to say to the committee that um, when Fiona McQueen took up her role as interim chief nursing officer, one of the first things uh, I discussed with her was my concern that we followed through on inspection reports and that we had assurance that this was happening. So if it would be helpful to the committee in due course, we could provide uh, a report that describes the actions we're taking, not just about the veil of leaving, uh, very significant though that is, 
But to assure ourselves corporately that, that we are taking every inspection report seriously and that we are not simply waiting until the next time an inspection comes round to work out whether we have actually responded appropriately. I think it's entirely appropriate that we have that assurance and I've asked uh, Fiona McQueen to, to, to help me in providing that. Well, I think I think that offer is uh, appreciated. It's a long time since the committee have actually looked at the, the inspection regime. We did look at it in some detail. Um, you know, we may want to come back to that at some point because we know that it's, it's the inspections. I think are sometimes directed by government, like um, the acute sector and other people. Um, you know, and uh, you know all, all of that as well. So, you know, an update on some of that would would be useful, and we appreciate we appreciate the offer and indeed. The, the offer of other information in terms of the, the, the analysis that's currently going on that the Cabinet Secretary offered uh, earlier. Thanks very much for that. Move, move on, and I think we're Nanette, yeah, thank followed you. by Dennis. Thank you, Convener. Um, my original questions about communication have largely been preempted, and I'll go on to something else. But, but before I do, I mean, in my experience of the health service over many years, communication has always been an issue, and not just with infection, but just to get basic proper communication between medical nursing staff and patients has always been an issue. It's quite concerning that we're in the 21st century now and that is still really is, is st still an issue. Um, I, I know that you were working on it. Are there any further steps that any of you think can be done to try and get this proper culture of openness um, really going right through from the, the top down to the patient level? Well, we are, of course, uh, looking at the, the duty of candour in terms of the, the public health bill. Um, I think the, the most important thing with that is just, again, the opportunity to reiterate the message of openness and needing to make sure that there is a, a, a duty on all staff, no matter who you are within the organisation, to, um, to report any concerns and that that becomes the culture. Clearly, that was an issue um, at the Vale of Leaven, that uh, you know, what people saw, some people brought concerns to attention, but then in some cases that wasn't acted upon, but others um, perhaps didn't. And um, So the duty of candour, I think, will help to add to the cultural changes that are happening and need to happen that are absolutely about um, a, a culture of, of openness and, and people speaking up about things they see that are not right. I think also our person-centred programme of putting people at the centre of, of everything that we do will help. The government expects there to be open visiting, so if families and loved ones are, are there more helping with care, then that level of communication almost disappears because they're there and they, they know what's happening. But we are expecting um, there to be full open communication, people involved in decisions about their care and their loved ones and getting access to consultants or nurses. <coughs> we, we know at times can be problematic, but we are expecting that to improve and some of the, the, the person-centred work that we're doing showing big improvements in, in how people experience communication and it will also be part of our, our care assurance programme. Mm -hmm. oh. um. yes, Just in responding further to uh, Ms Milne's point, um, let, let me start with something that, that doesn't work. Th there has been a long tradition in uh, the NHS in Scotland of issuing uh, things called chief executive letters. Um, I've more or less put a stop to that. There are some times when you have to do it because there's a legal requirement to convey information or it has to be done in that way. <laughs> but to be quite simple about it, writing a letter to chief executives saying something is no way to get frontline staff to understand what the issue is or to engage them in any um, delivery of it. So, for example, what the Cabinet Secretary did was not write to ch chairs and say, dear chairs, here is the Vale of Re Leaving report, it's very important, and I expect you to do something about it. Instead, we wrote to chairs and to chief executives and said, this is the Vale of Leaving report, here are the recommendations, now come and tell us what you're doing about it. And that's why we're able to report to the committee today on the progress we've made. On this patient safety programme, we're increasingly um, embedding the culture that it's important to put up 
in the ward where patients and um, staff can see it, the trends on patient safety. And I believe that as we, we, as we become more transparent in the NHS in Scotland, we will improve the services. I've said to this committee and I've said to the Parliament Audit Committee as well, sometimes it will be difficult. Sometimes we will see things transparently that we wish we hadn't seen. But in fact, only by doing that will we improve the service. And only by doing that will we give patients and staff the confidence that it's all right to say something. The last point I would make is one of the parts of the patient safety programme is that it gets people to speak to one another. So, for example, in wards or in accident and emergency departments, we have morning huddles where the staff come together and discuss what the issues of the previous day have been and what the issues of the day are that can be foreseen. That, I have to say, works a hundred times better than a letter from me telling people to do something. So I'm very serious about face-to-face -face communication. I think it's the way forward. I'm pleased to hear that. I mean, it's, it's almost reminiscent, re reminiscent of what we used to have with nurses getting together in the handover, discussing patients and, and handing that over. Because and a lot of patients are still a little bit in awe of a white coat and, uh, and a uniform. And it, 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 that can be much less formal and uh, better communication, and I think, would be great. What I was going to go on to ask about was antibiotic prescribing. Uh, I mean, Lord McLean was very critical about the mismatch pre-2008 on the, the difference between the guidance on prescribing and the actual practice of it. Um, and uh, I, I really wonder just how, how, if you're confident that things really have proper... I know there's been a lot of advance since then, but uh, are you confident that Lord McLean's recommendations um, will be carried out in that respect. And, and the other thing is that the report highlights really quite unacceptable delays in starting appropriate antibiotic treatment um, for, for patients who are diagnosed with uh, C. difficile. I think there's been a huge amount of progress in this area, really driven by the Scottish Antimicrobial Prescribing Group. Um, they've just sure, I don't know if you've seen the least, latest report they, they published um, in, in January um, uh, which is, is certainly worth a look at if you haven't seen it. But um, basically a, a huge um, amount of work on um, uh, the use of antibacterials um, in, in hospitals and, the, and also in terms of the, the appropriate um, prescribing. Um, so I mean, from, the, the, I guess there the amount of work that has been done in that area has shown um, big benefits when you look at the reductions in infection levels on um, uh, MRSA and on uh, C, C. diff. Um, so we have come a long way from those days and you know, particularly around um, the prescribing policies. Uh, but we can keep one step ahead because um, when uh, I was visiting... Um, hospital recently and we were talking about the success of the patient safety program in some ways it's always trying to keep one step ahead of the next big challenge when it comes to infection because um, we are always going to face new challenges and it is difficult uh, to keep one step ahead of that but I think that the work around the patient safety program is trying to do that so that you know, you, there's absolutely no complacency there whatsoever. A lot of progress, but no complacency because fighting infection in our hospitals are is an ongoing battle and one that we absolutely need to, to keep ahead of. Do you want to add? On? I, I, I don't have anything to add other than our, our CMO, our acting CMO, Dr. Keel, um, had the controlling antimicrobial resistance group. It's part of the national UK. Um, approach to, to taking that forward. So absolutely, when you look at the numbers and figures of, of reduction in, in the antibiotics, we want to see reduced, that's happening. And as the Cabinet Secretary said, uh, our, our sepsis bundle is part of the patient safety programme, which is an indicator of getting um, antibiotics to the patient within an hour. Um, it's certainly showing some very, very good progress. So yes. No, there's also a specific issue of uh, in C. diff of um, to narrow spectrum antibiotics. There's the, the one for I think it's called. Dr. Simpson will keep me right if I get wrong on this. Um, but which 
I believe it's south of the border is prescribed for sort of first recurrence or people at risk of recurrence, whereas SNC recommendations for Scotland is simply for first recurrence and, and not for those at high risk of recurrence. And I don't know if there are any comments on that. I think I think the, the prescribing of it is very patchy um, across health boards, particularly in Scotland. It is a matter for boards in terms of their own formulary for, for what to prescribe, but Dr Keel's group under the HEI task force will will be looking at, at prescri prescribing. Health Protection Scotland also gives us views and advice on prescribing, but the, the treatment of the individual patient is up to the clinician when it comes to that doctor making a decision um, about what's, what's best for their patient. Okay. Okay, now to Dennis Robertson, please. Uh, and uh, thank you, Kavir, and good morning. Um, yes, uh, I, I was actually going to go on the antibiotics, and I, I shall move on slightly. But uh, there was one there was one criticism um, that was mentioned with, with reference to um, the specimen and the identification and getting to the laboratories and timely. Um, so uh, I, I suppose a, a results from the lab and getting it back to the, uh, the doctors. Is that improved? Yes, it certainly has. And um, when I was visiting the Aberdeen Royal Infirmary, I had the opportunity to um, go behind the scenes to visit the, the labs. And what struck me was the amount of, of technology um, and technological improvements that have been brought in to speed up a whole range of um, procedures and tests that have um, really transformed the, um, the ability to, um, to get important information back to, into the, the hands of, of clinicians who are making judgments. So, um, so yes, it, it has improved um, and significantly. So, um, no, nothing, nothing to add. No. Uh, if I may move on, uh, in your opening statement, uh, Cabinet Secretary, you you uh, refer to the reference group. Is the reference group um, a? Are the members of the reference group um, from all over Scotland um, to reflect, obviously, the different health boards and the requirements of each individual health board? Um, I'll let Fiona say a bit more about this. The, we were keen that. Um, I mean, obviously, I've met with the, 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 the Vail, some of the Vale families on a number of occasions now, and it was really important that they um, were satisfied with the arrangements that were being put in place. And the reference group was really um, born out of those discussions, that we wanted to make sure that they had an ongoing involvement, a re you know, really um, important role. Um, but we also recognised that there was a wider... Um, Scotland-wide perspective. Um, so Fiona, and with her work with the group, has has looked at that. Do you want to say what? what? And, and apologies, I'm not sure that we have somebody from every, every geographical area within Scotland. What we have is our families from, from the Vale are, are clearly represented, but we have then our public partners perhaps from Healthcare Improvement Scotland or our third sector voluntary organisations, so such as the Alliance and um, the, the Health Council, so representative bodies that, that can have a representative role across Scotland are, are working with us. It's important that obviously given the situation that came from the Vale that the each area can have the confidence that they're being represented within this reference group? Yes, and a lot of the work, of course, of the implementation of the recommendations is um, for the boards to take forward and there are public partners involved in that and we would expect them to involve their public partners in that work. The reference group, um, their role is, is a bit wider in that it's about making sure that there is a that the, the work of the implementation group if you like is is overseen and that the 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 public get that reassurance that the pace is enough that the the monitoring is enough um but in terms of a you know the detail locally we would expect the boards to also be involving public partners and their non-execs as well in uh, driving forward the improvements that need to be made. Okay, and finally, convener, um, can you advise what discussions have taken with the General Medical Council uh, 
given they, they are the regulator of obviously the medical profession uh, and what their views are with regard to Lord McLean's report. Um, Paul, do you want to So we, we, we put the um, report uh, in front of the, the GMC and the Nursing and Midwifery Council at the time. Um, if the committee would find it helpful, I could ask Dr Keel to give a report uh, in writing on uh, engagement with the GMC on the issue because uh, I don't think it would be right for me to try and give a superficial account of that. Um, but if the, the committee would wish, I can certainly ask Dr Keel to do that. Well, discussion has taken place. We've, yes, we've already been in touch with them. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we now move to Richard Lyle. Thank you, Convener. Um Actually, one of the questions uh, Dennis has just asked, um, but uh, I'm more than happy to carry on with another question. Um, Lord McLean made six recommendations, uh, 36 to 41, to NHS boards in relation to medical care. These covered the range of issues including sufficient medical staffing levels, clinical assessment of patients with suspected C. diff, ensuring clear and accurate patient records, ensuring there was no unnecessary delay in processing laboratory specimens. He found that medical care of patients suffering C. diff was inadequate, poor record keeping, failures to carry out proper medical assessments and review, inappropriate prescribing and unacceptable delays in the commencement of appropriate antibiotic treatment, which again has been covered slightly. Um, so what do you, Cabinet Secretary, expect from NHS boards in ensuring that the lessons from Lord McLean's report in respect of the failures of medical care are learned? OK. Um, just before I come on to answer that, I maybe can just, um, having looked at the figures that the convener asked earlier on, just to, to clarify that point, that 11 boards have met 80% of the recommendations and those apply to the 14 territorial boards. So the average is 75% across all of the boards. So I hope that clarifies that point. No, I just... I, slight variances when you... I know. Well, it's important just uh, to, to, to put that on the record. But um, in terms of uh, Richard Lyle's point, I think... I mean, they, this gets to the nub of really some of the issues here on the medical care and the nursing care that... Um, there was appalling um, <coughs> practice and um, poor record keeping part of it, but uh, just uh, of the whole um, poor care um, on from um, from clinicians and from doctors and and from nurses, and you know that that was laid bare in the report. In terms of what has happened. Since then, we've touched on some of that already in terms of the um, making sure that there were no delays, uh, making sure that uh, getting uh, information back on tests, all of that is is completely different from what it previously was. Things around record keeping um, have improved, but we absolutely need to keep a, a watchful eye on that because <laughs> still sometimes when complaints um are are raised um sometimes uh, rec record keeping is still an issue not not to the extent it was in the veil of leaving report but there are still issues that we need to make sure that we um improve uh, that because it is important and, and communication as well um again that was highlighted very, very clearly in the medical care and nursing care that there was very, very poor communication. And again, although huge improvements have been made since the report, it's something we need to keep on top of because sometimes when complaints are made again, it is often about poor communication and uh, particularly with families. So we're not complacent by any manner of means and uh, you know, we want to make sure that any other... Uh, com complaints that have been investigated or reports that come up, we always are trying to, to make further improvements. Do you want to say anything about the medical care? Yeah, I, think, I think this is an integral part of the, the, the board responses. The, um, just in responding to, to Mr Lyle, what I'm, what I'm concerned to see is that the board responses to the 65 recommendations are all of a piece. So that there isn't a you know a, a part that this is down to doctors, this is down to nurses, this is down to cleaners, as though it we, we went back to a siloed approach um, 
that left, left people with the impression that as long as they did their bit, everything would be fine. It is only when we join this up. I think, I think again, to refer to the, the Scottish Patient Safety Programme, one of the things that that has done is to, in my view, greatly improve the communication between medical and nursing staff, allied health <laughs> professionals, um, and other staff who provide uh, services face-to-face -face, um, with patients. So, so uh, my response, Mr Lyle, would be to say that it would be important that we set these very important recommendations in the wider context of the whole delivery against the recommendations. I, I can certainly assure you, however, um, that both um, the our National Clinical Director uh, for, for Healthcare Quality, Professor Jason Leach, who leads on the um, Patient Safety Programme, and our Acting Chief Medical Officer, along with our um, Chief Nursing Officer, have, have been personally engaged in ensuring that uh, the recommendations for all parts of the service uh, are met appropriately and in line with um, our current uh, safety standards. And I'm sure from the time that I've known you, Mr Gray, that I know you're committed to the, the, the NHS and you, and you want to drive forward uh, uh, as, as, as much and ensure that we have the best service in, 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 in the world. Um, you said earlier that you don't do chief executive letters any, any longer. So, given Lord Maclean stated that NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde learnt lessons from the failures after 2008, what work are you doing uh, and undertaking to ensure that these lessons are rolled out to all NHS boards. You know, I know you're not doing letters, but what instructions are you putting down to these boards to say we can't t tolerate, tolerate this situation? Oh, I, I, I said I've tried to, to, to greatly reduce the number. There are some circumstances in which I can't uh, do it by another means. But um, I, what I'm seeking to convey to the committee is that I am not going to hide behind a letter and say, well, I've done my bit of the job by writing a letter. Um, both the Cabinet Secretary and I have engaged directly with the Chairs and the Chief Executives. And when uh, Professor McQueen has completed her analysis of the responses, then we will go be going back directly to the Chief Executives and to the Chairs with that to discuss with them both the quality and timeliness of their response and also their plans for implementation as overseen by the implementation group. So this is not something that we have done, either the Cabinet Secretary or I, on a one-off basis. We've, we've done our duty by, by ensuring that uh, a plan has been produced. This will be kept under review and this will be the subject of discussion <coughs> directly with both Chairs and Chief Executives. Lastly, can you, if you allow me, um, to the Cabinet Secretary, what Further actions do you believe would be required to implement the recommendations of Lord Maclean in, this, in, in the area we've just discussed? Well, we've got to make sure that we are satisfied and that the implementation group are, first of all, satisfied that all of the recommendations are properly implemented. So that is why uh, earlier on, um, we are talking about the oversight and monitoring of that. It has to. It will absolutely not be a tick box exercise. This is about um, making sure that some of the changes that have already happened. And you know, I think it's worth reiterating that you know, boards didn't wait for these recommendations uh, to come out in Lord Maclean's report. Many of the fundamental things had already been actioned and changes had already been made as you would have expected on, on, on such important fundamental issues. So we're now down to some of the other th recommendations that are maybe going to take a little bit more time, uh, but absolutely will be implemented. Uh, and then it's about making sure that, that the monitoring of that goes on, that, that the, the foot isn't taken off the pedal, if you like, to make sure that we constantly um, keep up the, the 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 pressure and the scrutiny around um, these absolutely fundamental aspects of how healthcare is delivered. Um, so, really, to reassure you, though, that you know we will be monitoring and making sure that boards um, don't just say they've done it, but we know they've done it, we, and that we we keep monitoring the uh, the ongoing effectiveness of of the recommendations being implemented. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you for that. Um, we now move to Richard Simpson.
Yes, just two quick questions. One is about recommendation 74 in the report, which is about comparison with other jurisdictions. Um, and one of the problems is, of course, when you look at Wales, Northern Ireland and England, they actually report differently. And, you know, it be, might be useful in having discussions with them to try and have a uniform system of reporting so that any opportunity to learn lessons is actually based on comp comparable data. Um, but uh, having said that, the, the two areas of variation that inter interest me at the moment are that England reports from the age of two, whereas we report from the age of 15. Now, I appreciate there are probably very few cases between two and 15, but nevertheless, it seems to me, even if there are a small number of cases, that it might be useful to, to, to actually understand why there's a difference. And the other thing, which has actually partly already been raised by, by Nanette Milne, is the difference in guidance by... Um, on fidaxomycin, uh, where first recur uh, potential recurrences in high-risk patients is recommended in England, but not in Scotland. Uh, and I appreciate it's a, it's a new drug; it's just coming out, and it is expensive. But nevertheless, uh, you know, if 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 it's if there's a difference in the recommendations, it would be interesting to actually be asking SMC what the uh, what the reasons for this are. Are I mean, if they're good reasons and there's no then we stick to our guns on that. But, um, you know, it'd be interesting to have that. And I just wonder what other things you've looked at in terms of that recommendation 74 uh, variation that might tell us something. OK, on the, the broader points, we absolutely learn from any reports. So the Francis report, um, we wrote to, to boards asking them to absolutely look at the, the findings of that report. Um, we're awaiting, obviously, the report on Morecambe Bay, which, again, we'll make sure that uh, lessons are, are learned for the service here. In terms of communication, I've just had a, a video conference with the Welsh Health Minister last week, and one of the issues we were looking at was very much around the, the sharing of the, the Veil of Leaving recommendations with uh, the rest of the UK, and um, that was <coughs> the, the Welsh Health Minister was keen to, to look at the application of the, the recommendations to the health service in Wales. So we, we do, um, it, it may be, I understand what you're saying about sometimes the systems are, are different and there may be good reasons sometimes that we, we do things in a, in a different way. Um, but there are always lessons to be learned from difficult and challenging reports, no matter where it occurs, not just within these islands, but further afield as, as well. Um, on the, the point of the age 2 to I, 15? I, I don't know, but I think on both points, I think we, we can ask Health Protection yeah. Scotland for advice well, um, about about the differences and, and similar with the Fidaxomycin. We yeah. can go back to, to SMC and... Well, right, back yeah. to the committee on that point. On Chapter 16, death certification, whether that's now been sorted out in terms of recording, because, uh, you know... I think one of the questions that the Vale of Leaven families were concerned about was it wasn't always recorded that it was a contributory factor. And I just I hope that we've got that reasonably sorted, that if there is if there, if there has been an episode of C. difficile, even if the patient dies subsequently from another cause, nevertheless obviously the weakening of their condition through C. difficile should be recorded and families explained as to what's actually going on. So just wonder if there's those recommendations, 68, 69, 70, 71, have been. Yeah, just uh, on on that, I mean, HEI deaths, um, I'm sure, as you're aware, are already recorded by the, the National Records of Scotland, and since um, September 2008, um, uh, Gross have published information about CDI deaths on their website. However, um, once the Death Certification Act comes into force this year, it will provide a, an additional review mechanism, and that will include random sampling and giving ministers the discretion to direct a review in any area of concern. So it's another check in the, the system. Um, I don't know. No, I mean, the, the only other thing to say in response to, to, to Dr uh, Simpson is that um, we will you know, we're reviewing what the, the boards have put to us, obviously, but we'll ensure that, that in, in, encapsulated in, in further advice to this committee is also um, the progress on the recommendations which were not for the boards, uh, just to make sure that, again, having 
made to, to, to Mr Lyle the point. We want to give a complete picture here um, and, and not be piecemeal about it. But I do understand entirely the point about the importance of accurate report recording and death, death certification uh, and uh, ensuring as far as we can that it reflects the actual circumstances as opposed to just a single cause which may have had other contributory factors. Thanks. Richard, can I thank committee members? Uh, Dennis? Just a small supplementary on that last point, if you... Can yes, of course. Just a small supplementary on that last point uh, to Mr Gray. Um, with, with reference to the certificates, uh, and I hear what you're saying, um, obviously comorbidity makes it quite difficult with, with some uh, areas uh, of the actual cause of death. Mm. Are you saying that the other factors and other ailments um, are going to be recorded uh, within the certificate? And uh, I mean, there's lots of reasons why people die, um, and sometimes on an operating table, for instance, and, um, you know, the, the cause can be very difficult to uh, identify. But are you giving us an assurance that all aspects of the patient's um, health, um, in terms of a contributory factor to their death, will be recorded? It, no, just for clarity, uh, Mr Robertson, I can't give such an assurance because clearly the um, decision on what to record rests with the person recording it and I'm not clinically qualified to decide on or overrule any such decision. But as the Cabinet Secretary has said, there are provisions coming in that if there is a concern uh, based on the sampling about the extent, accuracy or completeness of the recording, then there will be opportunity for that to be reviewed. But it would be wrong of me to give an absolute assurance to the committee. And indeed, the fact that there is a review mechanism in place suggests that this is something we will want to be keeping an eye on. So would that be clinicians and or patients that would actually bring this forward if they weren't satisfied with the certificate of death? Um, that, that, I, I think that can already be done, but if, if, if the committee would find it helpful, we can provide a more detailed briefing on the provisions um, and the legislation and what it's intended to produce by way of effect. Thank you. Thank you, Kibir. Very, very briefly on, on, on recording of, of C. diff, and if you want to write to me with information, that, that would be fine as well, because I'm, I'm keen to, 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 to allow the constituency member to, to get in or get some questions as well. Uh, just in terms of when C. diff is recorded more generally uh, within the hospital estate, I'm understanding that m many people will present to hospital and be screened and have C. diff on arrival, so it's not a matter of uh, it's about footfall to hospital and people having C. diff and then whether they contract it whilst in hospital and then you can have certification of death where tragically C. diff is a contributing factor or not as the case may be, but they may have had it on entry to hospital as well. Is that nuanced within statistics or is that something... I mean, I'm conscious that I don't want to tie health boards up with bureaucracy, but just in terms of understanding the patient flow and the statistics and, 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 and how, how, how this is rolling out uh, through the hospital estate, is that something that's nuanced within the statistics? Yes, it is. I mean, uh, you're quite right to highlight the fact that, that actually people from the community bring in, uh, in infections... Um, often to to the hospital and that's one of the challenges but um, the recording of hospital acquired infection is absolutely that it's about infections acquired in hospital not acquired in the community and that I think is an important uh, distinction and um, you know what we would um, record is where um, there has been a trans a, an infection from one patient to another within the the, the setting Okay. Don't know no, no, and I think that's a point well made that, that many people have the clostridium difficile within their system mm -hmm. and they live in a very healthy life and it's either when they're, they're given other drugs that, that causes a flare up um, or tragically if it were to be transmitted within hospital that that, that would then co cause a problem and yes these, these figures are recorded as such. Thank you very much. Yeah. I thank the members. Now move to Jackie Bailey. Member for the Barton Brackets Vale of Leaven uh, for her for her, uh, uh, her, her her opportunity to ask some questions. Thank you, Jackie. 
Thank you very much, convener, and can I thank the committee for the opportunity um, afforded to me. Can I put on record right at the outset my uh, welcome for the approach that the Cabinet Secretary has taken, in particular the involvement of the families um, in the implementation. The discussions reported to me by the families have all to date been extremely positive, so, so I very much welcome that. Um, can I start by, by just craving your forgiveness, because... I lack confidence in self-assessment, and I know you've asked the boards as at the initial phase to self-assess where they are against the recommendations. Um, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware that self-assessment was part of the problem in the first place, that health boards were asked to self-assess their HAI um, you know, measures, and you know, they just comprehensively failed to do so. So can I ask... Given that I think we would agree that we would want on-the-ground verification that this is real um, and that you're reporting to us in spring, will that verification have taken place with all health boards, not as a paper-based exercise, but in reality before that time period? I think you, you make an, an important point and um, the involvement of the families in the implementation group and the reference group is really, really important here because um, you're right that, that self-assessment um, takes us so far, but it was a starting point. We needed boards to tell us, first of all, where uh, they were at um, in relation to these um, recommendations. But what the implementation group is very clear, that its job is to verify and to monitor and to check that that is indeed the case, not just on the 65 recommendations, but all on the 75 recommendations, so the recommendations that are for others uh, to, uh, to implement. The, that process will be an ongoing one, and uh, you know, we, we will have got um, to a, a good position in spring in terms of our response and uh, uh, to the... Uh, to the report in terms of where we we have got by the spring, but it won't. We we want the work of the implementation group will go beyond that and will be an ongoing piece of work uh, to make sure that um, they are satisfied. In particular, the families are satisfied that no matter which health board it is, that these are absolutely have changed practice where that needed to change. Bearing in mind a lot of the recommendations on some of the fundamental things. Will have were implemented well before Lord Maclean reported, um, and the reference group, I suppose, provides an additional level of scrutiny to all of that to scrutinise the implementation group, if you like, uh, in a way that gives families more satisfaction again and reassurance that the implementation group itself are doing a good job in monitoring uh, all of that. So I think we've put in. I feel we've put in enough safeguards that we have, and, and I think you're right, I think the, the families to date anyway feel that, that they have been involved, but we're not complacent and we want to make sure that that, that continues uh, to be the case. I suppose, Cabinet Secretary, I want to know in my head that by the time you stand up in spring, what those self-assessments say is real. And I'm, you know, I accept what you're doing in the medium term, but it is that short term, short term sorry, check and I kind of wonder whether the Healthcare Environment Inspectorate doesn't have a role to go in and check the validity of what's being said just now. And I wonder in your response, I'm intrigued. Um, 11 boards have made the 80% mark. Which ones haven't and how close are they? OK, um, I'll come on to those in a second. Um, the, when I stand up, and I will want to have been assured that absolutely that the implementation of these recommendations is real and making a difference um, and, and that will be the case. However, the implementation group's longer uh, piece of work is I suppose to make sure the momentum behind these recommendations is kept up because it's not about a, a moment in time, job done, everybody's happy. It's about making sure that that the culture, um, that the, the changes the recommendations make are, are forever. And therefore, the involvement and the reassurance of families of that, for me, is, is very, very, very important. Um, in terms of the, the three boards um, that have to um, make the, the, the further progress, um, so we have three boards, Dumfries and Galloway, Lothian and Orkney, um, have fully or mostly... Um, implemented a less than 80% of the 65 
uh, recommendations, but only just, only just. So they're all in the, the 70s, so um, only just. And we will make sure that all of those three boards are um, get to the position of other boards and that all boards implement all of the recommendations. That's the, you know, there's no ifs and buts there. That's exactly what will happen. Okay, thank you for that response. Could I move on to the HAI task force or whatever it is we're calling it? Um, we got kind of lost in, in language there. Um, and, and let me be as, as blunt as possible, okay, because there's been an infection control team in Greater Glasgow and Clyde. There's been an infection control committee in Greater Glasgow and Clyde. All of these structures were in place in Greater Glasgow and Clyde. They just failed to work. So whilst I hear Fiona McQueen and absolutely agree the need for these kind of structures um, and accountability, Greater Glasgow and Clyde would argue that they had those in place that would enable you to go from ward to board in terms of reporting mechanisms. Um, now, we know from the report that the clinician responsible didn't attend meetings from July 2007 that she was responsible for chairing, didn't attend Greater Glasgow and Clyde meetings for 18 months over this period when the infection was raging at the Vale of Leven Hospital. So I wonder, given those systems were in place, given we've had a description of them just now, what's actually specifically different? Well, I can tell you very directly because I get alerted straight away when there is any uh, cases of, of C. diff or other infection within hospitals, whether that's in Glasgow, uh, in Clyde or elsewhere, because the monitoring systems work. And that information is relayed very quickly uh, to us and therefore um, any action required uh, is taken very, very quickly. Now, in all of those cases, um, you know, these are not necessarily outbreaks as such, it's just cases of C. diff. So that dashboard, if you like, is working and I know it's working because I get, uh, get uh, alerts to any cases. Now, that would not have been the case back uh, in the, the Vale of Leaven, certainly not um, within Glasgow and, and possibly um, certainly not the speed of that information um, you know, is, is very different and I have seen it for myself. So I'm reassured that we have um, not just the processes and the, 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 the people in place but that it actually works and that flow of information is very, very quick and more importantly the response to it is very, very quick. So, for example, patients are, are isolated. All of the procedures you would expect to kick in to prevent infection spread happens. When I go into hospitals now with the, the live screens, um, tell the story very visibly about uh, who is where and whether where there, if there are any cases, where they are, people, uh, that information is there for everyone, not least for the, for the staff. Um, to, to know in terms of anybody coming on shift what the actual picture at that moment in time is. So I hope I can give you reassurance that, that you know, I have seen it for myself and I, you know, I'm absolutely reassured that those systems are now working and that the situation that arose in the veil um, could not happen again because of, of that. There are so many people watching and monitoring that information for very good reasons that you know, we don't just... You know, we don't rely on a single person in the system to report. There is um, a lot of people whose job it is to make sure that these um, matters are, are monitored and acted upon. That's helpful to know. Um, can I ask, Fiona McQueen may have made an inadvertent comment, or maybe I just misheard her. Um, you, you talked about the reconvening of the National Task Force. Has it been dormant? No, it's not. And, and I did try and correct that suggestion that it hadn't been there's a national advisory group there, there's there's different structures that um I, I think could be more efficient and therefore i'm renaming and re and um reforming a uh, smaller more efficient and effective uh, and more targeted group Great. We like reform and efficiency. That's always a good thing. Um, can I ask, the, the Cabinet Secretary raised the question of isolation facilities, and that was a particular lack at the Vale of Leven Hospital. Um, can she advise the committee whether isolation rooms are now available in every hospital in Scotland? 
Well, certainly the, the processes um, that kick in when someone is uh, alerted uh, as being a, a, um, infected, so a test comes back and immediately, as I was describing to you earlier on, the person is, um, is moved, or in fact, if there are any suspicions, um, then the person is not um, in a bed alongside other people. So those processes kick in straight away to minimise uh, infection, often while the test is, is being commissioned and awaited. Um, so, so yes, I mean, there are absolutely the, um, the, um, the, you know, the, the, the change in the way that infection is handled is very, very different. And, you know, um, staff now know um, how to minimise um, infection uh, potential. Some, sometimes, um, unfortunately, uh, there, are, there are still cases of hospital-acquired infection, but the numbers and the drop in them, I think, tells its own story that those procedures, isolation being one of them, the, 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 um, the, the, I, the, not just in terms of when the test comes back, but if there are suspicions, all of that and all of the other actions that staff now know to take in terms of good infection control have resulted in those huge reductions in HEIs. I, I accept what she describes about the process. One of the significant challenges raised by nurses was that in, in order to fulfil the process she describes, they needed isolation facilities and they just weren't physically there. And that caused quite severe problems at the Vale of Leaven, but indeed on an ongoing basis. So my, my question was quite specific about do we have those physical facilities that enable that process you described to happen? Well, so for example, I saw for myself at the Glasgow Royal Infirmary when I was visiting, um, it's very visible, whereas someone with an infection, they are isolated and indeed the information is very clear um, in terms of the barrier that is required that patients are not, um, you know, that staff and patients are alerted in terms of not, you know, in terms of that person's space. So all of that is, you know, very different from um, the, some of the issues that we had, um, unfortunately, at, at the Vale. Okay. Um can I deal with just the, the very real pressure on beds at the moment? Again, that was a feature at the Vale of Leven, um, a hospital kind of operating under a great deal of pressure. I think, you know, over the winter period, the, the, there was a significant footfall at the front door, as we're seeing across Scotland. Um, and what hospitals do is they open new beds um, to cope with that pressure, um, albeit on an interim basis. Those beds tend to be squeezed into the same space, so actually the proximity of beds to each other is is you know much closer than is desirable. Um, how do we ensure that that doesn't happen again in responding to temporary pressures, the likes of which we see currently in the NHS? So the, the system um, over winter has has been challenging, and you know there's work to be done on why, particularly in Glasgow and Clyde, the acuity of patients. Um, there are also issues of kind of late flu surges, which we're looking at at, at the moment. Um, so all of that has led, as you rightly described, a, a pressure on beds. However, there is um, a, a lot of preparation for winter in that surge beds are planned for and therefore open when required. And uh, those surge beds would um, be, uh, we would expect the um, the guidelines around uh, space and staffing and uh, you know infection control to be the same for those surge beds as they would be for the beds that are there in the system um, the rest of the year. Uh, we're also, of course, uh, developing and expanding the intermediate care um, beds. And again, it's really important that uh, the infection control systems around those beds are, are good because quite often these are elderly people who are on their way home but not quite ready for this for they're clinically ready for discharge but not ready to go home so again vulnerable to potentially to infection so making sure that the the protocols and the uh, the, the guidelines around those beds are are good and the be follow the best practice in terms of infection control um, so you know, we absolutely need to make sure that where beds are being uh, used and there's a, a, a high capacity, 
that the, the turnaround of beds, that there's, there's the cleanliness standards are, are there. And again, we need, we're need we keeping a close eye on that to make sure that, um, we're, that there enough time is spent in cleaning the patient area when someone is um, discharged from a bed and someone's coming in to a bed. So all of these things are absolutely our issues, but one that we need to keep a very close eye on, not just over winter when beds are um, in demand particularly, but just all the year round, um, because it's good, it's the best practice and we know it controls infection. Okay. Um, my final question on the basis I'm testing the convener's patients. Um, recommendation seven from the public inquiry deals with, you know, whether it's structural reorganisation or significant change. Um, and it talks about specifically regular reviews of process um, and a review should include an independent audit. Now, I'm conscious the Southern General is probably... The, the largest project of its kind, um, certainly in the Scottish NHS, if not the NHS across the whole of the United Kingdom. Has there been that independent audit of infection control? When was it undertaken and by who? Can I, first of all, answer the, the issue on service change? I think what was apparent um, in this case, as you know, um, was the fact that the, the, just a lack of certainty over the hospital at the time. It, I think I described it in the statement as a, a hospital that was out of sight and out of mind and um, was not being given the attention it, it, it should have been and um, the, the lack of certainty about its future played in, I think, to staff morale and, and all of that. Um, so... Absolutely, lessons have been learned and had to be learned around any service change uh, proposal to make sure that um, uh, that we, you know, make sure we learn the lessons from that. I mean, in terms of the the new South Glasgow Hospital, I mean, it is the you know a, a huge uh, change um, as part of a long-standing acute services review in Glasgow. Um, the Facilities at the new hospital are second to none and state of the art, and all of these processes and procedures are will be tested um, as before staff and patients migrate onto the site from April onwards. Um, as you can imagine, this that is no small feat. It is a big, big job to um, to migrate all of these services onto the new site. But infection control um, is. Critical and of course one of the reasons that the hospital has been built in the way it is with the single rooms was part of uh, wanting to take best practice of infection control procedures and that's part of the design um, of the building. Um, so you know you can be assured that uh, absolutely all of these issues um, will um, be taken forward. Let me press you on this because, you know, here we have a new hospital mm -hmm. um, that's going to open after the public inquiry has reported that is in Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Yeah. A specific recommendation was an independent audit. I'm asking you, has one been carried out? When was it carried out? By whom? And can we see the conclusions? Well, what I, I certainly will get that information to, Jackie. I don't yeah. know if you. Yeah, I mean, the, there is a the, the cabinet secretary um, has already met the the chair and the chief executive of NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde to discuss the plans for opening the new hospital. I was part of that discussion. We've asked uh, for an update on the whole scope of these plans, and if it's helpful to the committee, we can provide information, including a response to Miss Bailey's question. Just so I'm. But has there been uh, an order uh, carried out as per the recommendation? I haven't. I haven't had the report, so the right. answer. So you don't know. Convener, we'll as I do not yet. No. We we'll have to check that, convener, and we will. And we'll that, get that uh, answer to you and to Jackie Bailey. Yeah, that, 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 that's fine. Yeah. Whether it's taking place or, or not, or yeah. what information is available. And if it hasn't, it will. Yes. Yeah. So okay. We'll check that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, can I um, thank the members um, uh, and Jackie Bailey for being with us, but most of all, the Cabinet Secretary and her colleagues, thank you very much for uh, your valuable time and evidence with us this morning. Um, I'm going to suspend at this point. Very, very briefly, I'm going to ask members to re remain in their, in their chairs and don't break up. We're going to clear the room and we're going to move uh, to... Uh,
our next item on the agenda, which is item two, which we have previously agreed we, we would uh, hold in private.